must look real similar. All right, so um, like x over like x to the third or something like that. Right. So player player one uh, player one selects the number x. And then player uh, two observes it, and then they simultaneously and independently pick. Um, so with the simultaneous, then it's going to be dotted lines, right? Correct. OK. All right, and then the payoffs are I swear we solved this one. I made mistakes on the uh, on the derivative. Like I forgot to put I, I forgot to put the um, one of the one of the numbers in there. Either x times y one. Uh, the solution ends up being uh, y one e or x equals y one. So whatever player. Um, one picked in the beginning. He he picks he picks the same number at the end. Man, this this seems really hauntingly familiar. Is x one over three? Uh, this one here. Yeah. Uh, y two squared. Okay. So, um, we have to. Uh, so in the, in the second period, like when, when player one and two both simultaneously move, they both take X as already given, right? So we solve the games from back to front. This is like, uh, the backward induction. So we, uh, base player one, um, can't revise the choice of X once she's making the choice, um, in that second period where she's picking Y1 and player two is picking Y2. So X is already given, so we treat it as if it's a constant. And so uh, player one's uh, derivative with respect to, sorry, this is respect to Y1, and he's treating, uh, he's, he's making a guess of what is Y2, and he already knows what X1 is. So this derivative is equal to his guess of Y2 plus, x which he already knows because he picked it in the first period minus 2 y1 and then the minus x to the third divided by 3 falls out because it's just a constant all right and uh it, the second derivative of this thing is just negative 2 which is negative so it's concave problem and we let that be y1 star so here we're going to have that um y1 star is equal to uh, one half times uh, y two bar plus x. Okay, so that's the that that's the best response function of player one once x has already been chosen and uh, simultaneously forms the belief about uh, the action of player two. And player two's best response function. is so this this uh requires that we use the chain rule i won't make you guys use the chain rule on your uh on the final but you have to take the derivative of the uh, of the function on the inside of the parentheses so so we do uh negative two times y1 minus y2 to the first power and then we have to take the and that's a y1 bar that's a belief about player one and then we have to take the derivative on the inside of the parentheses, which is just minus one. Okay. Uh, and so uh, that equals um, 2y1 bar minus 2y2 star 
equals zero, and so y two star equals uh, y one bar. Okay, so player two just wants to make a guess about what player one does uh, and then imitate it. And that should be clear from the utility function because inside the parentheses is uh, y1 minus y2, and we're gonna square that and take the negative. So the best that could possibly happen is that player two gets a payoff of zero, a utility of zero, uh, when the two numbers equal each other. Otherwise, the further apart they are, the more negative they're gonna be, okay? So these are the best response functions. And so in equilibrium, uh, going back to, so in um, equilibrium of this subgame, remember it's a subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. So both players have to be playing equilibrium in every subgame. So the subgame where they move simultaneously, uh, we have to have y1 star equals one half times y2 bar, and we know that that's going to be equal to uh, the same thing as y1 star. So we make the substitution of player two's best response function into player one's. Okay, and so um, I can subtract uh, one half y star from both sides, which means I'm just gonna have one half y1 star on this side uh, is equal to one half x on this side. Uh, so clearly y1 star equals, we already know it's equal to y2 star equals x. We definitely solved this problem, right? <laughs> yeah, I just looked at nine and it's the same except for the, it just asks for player two observes x and nine. It's just the opposite. So it's okay if we skip it. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, so now, now we're all, we're we're almost we're almost done. So okay. we might might as might as might as well finish it. No, that's that's why I see. But yeah, it's like I, the, these numbers look too too familiar. Um, yeah, I just didn't recognize that it was asking for Stackelberg when I it was see. asking for the I, Nash equilibrium. Okay, but no, no, no problem. This is uh, this is going better than the first time. <laughs> uh, so now in, 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 at the beginning, player one knows how the game is gonna resolve. Like player one knows that whatever she picks as X is also in the sub game gonna be the same value as Y one star and Y two star. And so she's gonna be able to substitute those values of Y one star and Y two star into her, her, her utility function before doing the optimization. So she knows uh, um, in S, P, and E, she knows that uh, her utility is going to equal uh, x squared, because there's the, the first part of her utility function is y1 times y2, but both of those values are going to equal x, and then another x squared x plus y1, which she knows is going to be x also. And this is going to be minus x squared, and then minus x to the third over 3. OK, uh, which is just equal to x squared minus x to the third over 3. All right, she knows that's going to be true, that, that her choice of x is then going to dictate what later happens to y1 and y2. And so now she takes the derivative of this utility function with respect to x, uh, and she gets 2x uh, minus x squared. Uh, and uh, the second derivative of that is gonna be negative two. Uh, well, uh, no, it's gonna be, sorry, the, the second derivative of this is going to be two minus two x, which as long as x is greater than zero is going to be a negative number. and x has to be greater than or equal to zero uh, by assumption. So this function is concave on the domain uh, that we're allowed to, to pursue. So we can set that equal to zero, and then that's gonna be our x star. I'm not gonna put a star in there yet because uh, there's a squared, and it's gonna get look a little messy. Uh, so we know, Professor, yeah. it's yeah. supposed to be x to the one over three power. Say again? It's supposed to be x to the one over three power. What is supposed to be? 
x to the one third power for the original equation, not x three over three. Oh, wait, it's uh, the utility function that's x to the third divided by three. So the the this uh, this is this right here is okay. It's that x to the third over three is is the it, it's it's one third times x to the third that that's what they gave us uh, as the as the utility function. So uh, we're good here, and then uh, we're good here, and then when we take the derivative of that second term, uh, it's um, uh, we, the three goes out in front, and so the three on the bottom uh, drops out, and so it's just negative x squared. So this this should be good. Okay, sorry. No, no worries. Uh, and so uh, we know that x times uh, 2 minus x equals 0. We might as well throw our stars in there now. Since we, the exponents are gone. OK. And so we know that either uh, x star equals 0 or x star equals 2. Those are the two solutions to that equation. Uh, we also know that if um, x equals zero, utility of player one is zero. Uh, so we can see that by just substituting into that um, top function up there. Uh, zero squared minus uh, zero to the third over three is zero. But if we plug a two in there, we get uh, uh, two. So we have uh, x squared is four and then minus uh, uh, x to the third, which is eight over three, four over um, four minus eight over three is a positive number. And so we know the solution that we want is this one. And the reason we're getting two solutions there is the fact that at x equals zero, this is uh, not a concave problem anymore. Uh, that the, 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 the slope, the second derivative is equal to zero when x equals zero. Uh, so on the on the rest of the domain, uh, we would get a unique solution, but here we have two solutions because the, so we have to check that the x equals zero isn't a better solution, uh, but it's not. It's worse. And so the S P and E is that uh, x equals two, y one equals two, and y two equals two. So all the values for all three choice variables are two in the subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. All right. Anyone have a, anyone have any questions about, about that problem? Uh, the math is a little bit more challenging. You have to use the chain rule. We have two solutions. So it's like, it's a little bit more advanced than uh, what we've done in class or what I put on the final exam. Uh, but the way that you go about solving it is, uh, is definitely uh, something eligible to be on there in the sense that uh, you know, you have to understand that player one and player two moving second, we have to solve that part of the game first, but in, we're going to apply a backward induction. So we take the choice of X as given, solve for X1 and, or Y1 and Y2 simultaneously in the sub game, find that equilibrium, and now plug that equilibrium uh, back into the original game and then maximize the utility from player one's perspective, knowing what's going to happen in stage two. That's the key to this question. Uh, the math is a little, little bit more tricky than, than what I, I'm going to have on the final because uh, I'm not expecting you to remember the chain rule. Uh, uh, questions about this one? Professor, I have a question about a different problem. Yeah. The, the one you did in uh, video chapter 15, uh, the second video, when there's an uh, eight, by, eight by four table. Uh, I don't remember it. What number is it? Uh, it's the one you went over in your lecture, the video lecture. So we ended up uh, with uh, six um, solutions, but we only pick only two of them. Oh, okay. So we found six Nash equilibria, but only two subgame perfect Nash equilibria that were pure strategies. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, that's the one. Okay. So. Yeah, I still cannot figure out why it's only two. Uh, I know why it's, um, we don't pick up two of the other ones, but uh, I'm not sure about the other two. 
I don't know how to. Uh, you have to remind me of what the game is. I don't remember the game at all. Uh, so how, how does it – so it, it, presumably it starts off with player one. And what yeah. choices does part what what choices do play this player one make? Let me see if I can just uh, make a screenshot. Uh, well, yeah, I, I have I have the video lectures here too. Let's see if uh, is, is it in part one or part two? Or part two. I think it's the and question. Is it, is it to, okay, I see. Towards it. the end. Um, yeah, I got it. So we have uh, player one chooses A or B, and this is from chapter 15, video lecture two. It made more sense. Okay, so you have something. Okay. Player. Yeah. And this would be equivalent even if the game B, even if B was out, a strategy out, and there was no sub game after, it was just a payoff of 5-3, it would be the same thing. Because oh, that's of the knowledge of rationality. Sorry. That's right. That's my voice. I'm like, like <laughs> that, guy, that guy knows what he's talking about. Who is that guy? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's more towards the end, uh, like, it's like 10 minutes before the video finishes when we have already the table eight by four and we have eight solutions circles, but we only pick up two of those. Right, so let's see. Uh, uh, uh. So we, oh, one sec, what happened to, there we go. Zero, zero, two, six, six, two, four, four, five, three, four, four, two, two, six, one. And we found that in the bottom sub game, there is a um, unique uh, Nash equilibrium. So in in this, so I, I won't I won't solve these since they're solved in the video. But we found that um, uh, this Nash equilibrium here is y uh, is y z. No, can't be. Uh, this is e y. Sorry. I think someone just uh, chatted. I can't see all this stuff simultaneously on my screen, but I think I saw a message. Someone asked if I'll post the video. Uh, I will. I, I will post the video, provided that the video uh, saves and and everything. So it's uh, like I, I I I my plan is to post this video, and I haven't had any problems doing that before. But you never know uh, with technology. So my, 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 my plan is to post this video uh, after we're finished, uh, for sure. Uh, so uh, the Nash equilibrium in the bottom is EY. The Nash equilibrium in the top uh, is, uh, there's two pure strategy equilibria. So uh, one of them is DW and the other one is CX. So CX and DW, okay? So, uh, yeah. So in the in the subgame perfect Nash equilibrium, we know that in the top we must either play CX uh, or DW, and in the bottom we must play um, uh, EY. There's also a mix. Uh, there's also a mix up here, but let's. Uh, There's also a mix up there in the top, but let's let's uh, let's forget about that for now. So um, when player one makes the choice of choose a, of A or B at, at, at the first node, um, he has to in an equilibrium, he'll know which equilibria all the subgames are played in as well. So he'll know whether the top subgame is played in the CX equilibrium or the DW equilibrium. 
if it's played in the CX equilibrium, uh, player one's payoff is going to be six. Whereas in the EY equilibrium, player one's payoff is three. So uh, if CX uh, NE in top sub game, then player one chooses A because A gives a better payoff than picking B. So S, P, and E is uh, A for player one uh, in the top and C, I'm sorry, he picks A at the first node, picks C um, in the top and picks uh, in the bottom, he always has to pick E because it's all, it's, it, it has to be an equilibrium in every sub game. Whereas player two, uh, we've agreed that um, it's the CX equilibrium uh, in the top. So he uh, must be playing X in the top and in the bottom uh, always has to play Y. Okay. So that sub game, so that's one sub game, perfect Nash equilibrium player one believes that um, the top, uh, sub game will be played CX, so he plays A because the payoff is better than paying B, and he has to be correct in his belief because if he was incorrect in his belief and the top equilibrium, the, the top sub game will be played in a different equilibrium, then player one uh, uh, would want to revise his strategy so it can't be an equilibrium. Okay, so the top, so so one one sub game perfect Nash equilibrium is this one, and then the and, and another one is if the top sub game is played in DW. If the top is played in DW, player one gets a payoff of two, but by going B, he still gets a payoff of five. So if, uh, if the top is played in DW, player one chooses B, and then uh, the SPNE in that case, is going to be player one picking B, and then in the top sub game they're playing DW, uh, so player one is playing D up top, and then player one always plays E in any sub game perfect Nash equilibrium in the bottom, and player two uh, must be playing W in the top, and always must play um, Y in the bottom. So that's another sub game perfect Nash equilibrium. So we found these two. So these two pure strategies are sub game perfect because they implement an, equ an equilibrium of every sub game. So all three sub games, the two yellow ones plus the full game, all of them are played in equilibrium. Uh, and every player is doing the best they can, uh, you know, in, in, the full, in the full game. So, yeah. Uh, and there's also one more sub game perfect Nash equilibrium uh, it, where the top sub game is played in the mixed strategy equilibrium. I showed that in the in, in the video lecture. Uh, that um, so that that one has a payoff to player one, an expected payoff of. I'm looking through my video and not seeing the. I'm looking for the math. There we go. Uh, player one gets a pay, expected payoff of three, so a third. S P N E is top sub game played the mixed strategy equilibrium. Um, and uh, that mixed strategy equilibrium is, uh, is has player two choosing W, uh, half the time so we can write it as player two has has um sigma two equal one half one half and if player two is playing one half one half uh between y and z um then uh player one the, uh, the expected payoff of player one equals three, uh, so choose B. 
So player one's going to pick B, um, and you know, at, at the initial no because she knows that she if she goes uh, B, she gets a payoff of five. If she goes uh, A, and they play in the mixed strategy equilibrium of the top sub game, that her expected payoff is three. So B is the better choice. Um, but then the top sub game has to be played in the mixed strategy equilibrium. Uh, and the bottom one still must be played uh, with with her um, choosing uh, 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 e. Okay, so uh, I, I, yeah, and then I mean that's that should that's all spelled out in the in, in the in the book. So in order to write that subgame uh, perfect Nash equilibrium, so since player one has eight strategies available, we'd have to then list all eight of those strategies so that I know what order to put that stuff in. Uh, but the important thing is, is that she's in the mixed strategy equilibrium. Both players are playing uh, one half, one half. So it's basically um, choose B uh, for sure uh, and then choose E. But if I had picked A, pick 50-50. That's player one strategy in the third sub game perfect equilibrium. So there's three sub game perfect Nash equilibria in this game. Two of them are pure strategies. So all of the ones that we circled uh, are Nash equilibria in the in the matrix form, but only um, o- only two of them are uh, only two of them are uh, are, are something perfect. So someone just posted, why is CX an equilibrium in the top, but not XZ in the bottom? Uh, so the CX. F F Z. So if player if player two if player one is picking F in the bottom sub game, then player one then play if player one picks F, player two won't choose Z, she would pick Y. Because if player one is choosing F in the bottom sub game, so this is player player one here. If player one is choosing F. Player two's uh, payoff choices are by choosing Y, she gets four, and by choosing uh, Z, she gets one. So player two, in response to player one picking F, would want to play Y and not Z. But if player two picks Y, player one's better off choosing uh, E instead of F because the payoff is bigger. So if you put this, um, this sub game here, if you put that subgame into a matrix, it's a two by two matrix. You'll find that um, Y E. Let's make sure I got that right. Uh, yes, you'll find that Y E is the unique Nash equilibrium of this subgame. But in the top subgame, there are um, two Nash equilibria, two two pure strategy equilibria. This one. Uh, CX and this one, DW, are both equilibria. If player two plays W, player one's payoff is maximized by picking D. And if player one picks D, player two's payoff is maximized by picking W. So that's an equilibrium. And similarly for the, for, for the um, uh, CX. If player one picks C, uh, player two should pick X because two is bigger than zero. But if player two picks X, then indeed player one should pick C. So those are both uh, uh, th- those are both equilibria. Does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. Cool. And then so okay, cool. All right. Other questions. Let's move to a new whiteboard. Is it okay if we go over the answers for 11 because there's no key? I think I have them all right, but I'm not sure. This is 11, chapter 15. 15, yeah. Uh, let me see. How many proper subgames? I'm never going to ask you that, by the way. Uh, solve the game by backward induction. I will ask that. Find the set of strategies that survive iterated conditional dominance. I, I, I've, I haven't talked about conditional dominance. You don't have to worry about that question. Uh, 
compare the path through the tree that results from the strategy you found in part B uh, with the paths that are, cons uh, yeah. So don't worry about C and D because we, we, we didn't, we didn't discuss uh, conditional dominance. Okay. Um, yeah. Yes. Anyway, I don't know if it's right. Can you say it again? I oh, yes. Anyway, I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not, don't, don't, uh, it's not, a, it's not, a, it's, it. yeah, it's not, a, it's not a subject that I'm, 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 I'm teaching. So yeah, don't, don't worry about it. Um, this game, this game has, uh, every player's, uh, every player's, uh, choice is unique. Every, every best response is unique from what it seems like, because every payoff is unique. So this game has a unique equilibrium. So in games of perfect information, if there's no ties, they're super easy to solve by backward induction. Every single, it, it always reduces to a unique subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. Uh, but if there's ever a case where one of the players um, had, faces a choice where whichever way she goes, it's a tie, that can open up a lot more equilibrium. But that doesn't seem to be the case in this one. This one has a unique equilibrium. All right. Yeah, but don't don't worry about the uh, C and D. They're those I'm not I'm not talking about uh, about conditional uh, about conditional dominance here. So would the whole game be considered a sub game here? Yes. So yeah. would it be eight sub games. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six. I'm seeing seven. Okay. Yeah. So each each of the four spots that player one moves is a sub game, and then player two each of the spots that she moves is a sub game. So now we're up to four, and then or sorry, now we're up to um, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then the whole game is a sub game. Again, yeah, I'm I'm not I'm not ever going to ask you guys what like how many sub games is. That's more of a definitional question. What I tend not to answer. I, my my questions are always more. Uh, you know, conceptual questions as opposed to definitional. Yeah. So, like you have to know what's you have to know what sub games are to be able to find sub game perfect equilibrium. But I, I don't have to. I'm never going to ask you how many sub games there are. So here would it be H, J, K, M, D, E, and B. Uh. Well, we can, uh, let me, might as well write it down, uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, So all player one, no information, uh, no, no dash lines. J, K, L, M, N, and payoffs three, four, four, three, one, two, five, seven, six, five, two, eight. Nine one. One thing to notice about this game is how big the strategy space is for player one. That's something, or, or for yeah, for player one in particular. So player two has four strategies. Player one has um, uh, two to the fifth strategies. So uh, thirty-two strategies. So if you were going to put this game into the strategic form, uh, it would be uh, thirty-two by four strategic form matrix form. So that's a big one. And so that also means that there might be a whole lot of Nash equilibria in that really big matrix. Um, again, so, so the, it's the, 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 the size of the strategy space, you have to pick one action at every information set. Player one has five information sets. So her strategy has five actions. Uh, now a strategy has, has five letters in it for player one. And now we have to think of all the different combinations and that's going to equal the product of the of the individual action spaces. And so she say each of them is five. So it's going to be you know, two times two times two times two times two to the fifth. So anyway, so representing that in the strategic form is going to produce a whole lot of Nash equilibria that aren't subgame perfect.
Uh, it wasn't the, the the question didn't ask to put that into the strategic form, but it's useful to think about. Uh, and now for the uh, for the sub game perfect. So player one is going to pick H here, J here, K here, M here, and those are unique. Uh, given uh, player one's choices, player two is going to pick D uh, here because she knows if she picks C, player one will pick H. If she picks D, player one will pick J. And player two's payoff is bigger by picking D. And then at the other information set for player two, she's going to pick E uh, because K results in a better payoff for her than M does. And now player one. No, she's going to get five by playing A, and she's going to get six by playing B, so she plays B. And so the S, P, and E is for player one uh, strategy uh, to be uh, B, H, J, K, M, and player two strategy D, E. That's the unique subgame perfect Nash equilibrium of this game. Uh, but just remember, this is only uh one strategy for player one of the 32 strategies that player one has available uh so the, there there could be there probably is a ton of nash equilibrium in this game that aren't sub game perfect all right is that is that that's what you got anita yeah i got this all right cool so this would be the answer if you specifically only ask for backward induction for sp and e yeah, that, that's all I'm ever going to. I, I'm never I, basically for chapter fifteen. I'm going to uh, ask you guys for uh, subgame perfect Nash equilibria. That that's that's the that's the name of the game. Uh, and so you find subgame perfect Nash equilibria by backward induction uh, in games of perfect information. I mean, there are. I mean, we know exactly where we're at each point in the game. Uh, so those are easy uh, games that have. Uh, multiple uh equilibria in you know i'm sorry G games that have uh like the game the last game that we looked at um that one could be solved by backward induction in the in the bottom so the bottom sub game uh the, the last game on the last page the bottom sub game was was unique and so we know uh uniquely what's going to happen in the bottom but the top had two pure strategy equilibria and one mixed strategy equilibria and so that's going to depend earlier in the game it's going to affect you know which of those equilibria are played is going to affect what the action is early in the game so that just that starts to create a whole lot more potentials for subgame perfect equilibria but but yeah chapter chapter 15 uh the only questions i'm going to ask you related to chapter 15 are to um identify subgame perfect nash equilibria uh and uh be able to put extensive four games into the strategic form and find those Nash equilibria of the, of the, of, of the full game and do a comparison of the two. Professor, can you go on over all the chapters and approximately what questions from each you're going to ask, like, like you did right now from chapter 15, can you go like chapter one, you're going to ask to transform to extensive form chapter two, you're going to ask to transform to uh, so the 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 final should be um, roughly equal distribution by time that that we spent on 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 material. So the longer we spend on something, the more likely there'll be you know more uh, questions related to that. Uh, it'll be slightly more heavily weighted on chapter 15 because we haven't been, we haven't had a quiz on that. So the, there'd be like, you know, throw an extra question on top of uh, its proportion for the course, but, but not, not like exorbitantly. So, uh, and then, uh, really the thing is like a, a lot of the, the, the stuff earlier in the course, um, was used to build to the stuff later in the course. So the, 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 the final is really going to focus on, on finding, you know, you ha you have to be able to translate uh, uh, an extensive form. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, you have to be able to to translate a description of a game into the into the extensive form. But is that a chapter two question or is that a fifteen question? Right, because they're uh, that you can find that in um, chapter two, but you can also find it in chapter fifteen, where you know they they you know I think I think anyway, uh, yeah. There's some questions in chapter 15 that are saying like, okay, put this game into the extensive form 
and now do this, that, and the other. Uh, so anyway, so being able to take a description, put it into the, into the branches, into the extensive form, being able to take uh, the extensive form and putting it into uh, the matrix form, like, is that a chapter three question? Yes, but it's also a chapter 15 question, because if you're going to look at this game that we have on the screen now, uh, question number 11, if you're going to find the subgame perfect Nash equilibria and compare it to the set of all Nash equilibria, you have to be able to put that into the strategic form, right? So it's both a chapter three question and a chapter 15 question. So basically, like, you know, all the chapter two questions and all the chapter three questions could be like standalone questions, but they could also be part of a chapter 15 question. You know, you have to be able to take this description, put it into the game, into the tree, then put that into the matrix, then find all the Nash equilibria, and now do back back reduction on it. So yeah, it's hard to to say, yeah, like like a breakdown of like how many questions from each chapter, because so much of the earlier chapters I'm using in the later chapters. So it's hard to say what chapter the question came from. Uh, but yeah, stuff you have to know for sure is, is putting descriptions into trees, putting trees into matrices. Um, some of the earlier stuff before we got to rationalize ability. So, um, you know, what, what is, uh, the best response set? Uh, what's the best response to a particular belief? Uh, what are the, what's the notation for beliefs like your theta, your thetas and your, you know, your theta minus I and your, and your sigma I, I'll have a couple questions that are like that. So say, let's say chapter four, five, six, but they're, they're not an emphasis the, those chapters were more trying to give you the building blocks that you're able to do chapters seven, uh, eight, nine and 11 and 15. Like the, so, so that, you know, the chapters four five and six are mostly about building apparatus, mostly about building notation so that we can get to the good stuff in, in chapters. Uh, I guess that was, sorry, chapter four to seven. So I think chapter four to seven are mostly building blocks to get to chapter eight, uh, which is rationalizability. Uh, no, seven, I'm sorry. Now, now, now I remember what it is. Four, five, six are building blocks. Seven is rationalizability on matrices. Eight is rationalizability on non-matrix games. And then nine is um, Nash equilibria. Uh, Eleven is su- is mixed strategy Nash equilibria, and then fifteen is subgame perfect Nash equilibria. So really, like most of the course is about rationalizability, Nash equilibrium, and subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. Chapters, uh, you know, two, three, four, five, six are mostly there to help us get to that point where we can start talking about how people play games. But I, I will probably throw a couple questions in there, like. Hey, if theta minus one, you know, if I, here's a, here's a matrix, A, B, C, X, Y, Z, uh, if theta minus two equals uh, one half, one fourth, one fourth, uh, what is the best response uh, of player one? Uh, to uh, given uh, theta, uh, oops, best response of player two uh, of theta minus two. So I could ask something like that. Uh, I could also say, uh, you know, what is um, B1, for example. So B1 is the, is the set of all best responses to all possible beliefs. Uh, we know that in a, uh, that in a two-player uh, finite game, that um, B1 and uh, UD1 are the same sets, right? So B1, uh, the, 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 there's, a, there's, a, there's, there's always an equivalence between those two uh, concepts. Uh, so, yeah, I'd say out of all the early stuff, know how to translate, uh, you know, descriptions into trees, trees into matrices, you're definitely going to have to be able to do that. Also know, you know, what is, what is uh, theta uh, or sigma I, what is theta minus I, what is BRI, what is BI, what is UDI. So that's, I think that's pretty much all the notation 
So I, I, I if I throw just BRI and a theta minus I, I'll expect that you know what those mean. Uh, and maybe there would be, you know, if there's 20 questions, that's probably a good guess. 20 questions on the final. Um, there'll be a couple questions that are um, that ask, you know, basically are just tests of your knowledge of that you know what BRI is, but very few. So there's not going to be a lot of uh, of questions of that nature. They're going to be more about. You know, what's the equilibrium of this game? Uh, what is it, you know, is it sub game perfect? All that kind of stuff. But yeah, that's, that's the nice thing about a course like this is, is like in chapter 15, you can, ex like with, with the exception of chapters um, four through eight, chapter 15 uses every single chapter that we went through in the course, right? It uses chapter two a lot. It uses chapter three a lot. It uses chapter nine a lot. It uses chapter 11 a lot. So it's like, it's building on all that other stuff. So a chapter 15 question is really using two thirds of the chapters of the book, if not more uh, to this point. So if you understand the chapter 15 questions, there's really no reason to like spend a lot of time reviewing chapter two, three, et cetera. Okay. Uh, but yeah, and, and, uh, from, and from chapter eight, what kind of questions should we expect? Are you going to put some uh, social unrest kind of problems or? Um... Yeah, I mean, it's so it'll be, you know, just understanding the concept of rationalizability. It, it could be, I mean, the midterm would be the best bet of the types of questions I could ask. So it could be, you know, a, 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 a game that we studied in the, in the, um, you know, in, in chapter eight directly, it could be from a chapter eight, uh, end of chapter question, or it could be something that's similar to something we did in the, in the lecture or in the, in the end of chapter question, but just like a slight twist on it. Um, but it'll be one of those things. So chapter eight and in chapter eight questions are, are, are typically among the tougher ones in the course, uh, for sure. I mean, I, I think it's the hardest chapter in the, in, in, in the course. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, they, they, they could end up being, you know, more challenging than some of the other ones. Uh, I, I, the level of difficulty overall on the final will be a little easier than the midterm, uh, because the midterm was focused on some of the tougher chapters of the, of the course, whereas the final will be more comprehensive. So, I mean, to the extent that you think taking a paragraph description and putting it into the extensive form, like that wasn't tested on the midterm, but it will be tested here being able to take that game and number 11 above and put it into a matrix. Now that I would probably wouldn't do that because it's a 32 by four matrix, but being able to translate extensive form to strategic form, like I view that as an easy question. Uh, so if you also, if you agree that that's an easy question, that that question should be pretty fast and, 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 and help build your, your points in the final. Uh, you didn't have questions like that in the midterm or the question below if theta minus two is equal to one half, one fourth, one fourth, what is the best response of player two? Um, you know, that's just okay. Uh, um, that, that's the belief of player two about player one. Player two thinks player one is doing this. Given that player one, he believes player one is doing that, you can calculate the utility of X, the utility of Y, the utility of Z, and expectation. Just weight each of those by the probabilities uh, and then pick the one that's biggest right? Or the two or the three, if there, if there's ties. Okay. So I, I would view that as a, as it's, it's mechanical. It's a, you know, but it's like, you know, exactly what to do. There's no thinking involved. It's a, okay, I know what to do. I just apply the formula and do it. Uh, so there will be, you know, a number of questions on the final that are of that variety that you don't have to sit there and be like, okay, I haven't seen this game before. Let me think about like, what's the rationalizable set? What's it like, you know, so I, I think the final should be easier in the sense that there will be more kind of mechanical plug and chug questions on it. Certainly not all of them, uh, but uh, it'll help build up points. Uh, you know, there, there were there weren't there weren't so many freebies on the on the midterm as there will be on the final. Uh, but but the 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 quiz basically anything that I asked you in the quizzes, uh, anything that I did in the video lectures uh the recommended end of chapter questions like any of that stuff or there or, or deviate you know slight deviations from that stuff that's all kind of fair game uh to be on the on the final and it should be a pretty even spread throughout the semester but again like if i asked you a chapter 15 kind of question that's bringing in multiple chapters you know chapter two chapter three chapter nine chapter 11 and chapter 15 so like it's uh 
you know, I could ask a, a and uh, some of the questions will be multi-part, you know, so. Thank you. Yes. Uh, other, other questions you guys have uh, about, um, yeah, anything. Uh, can we talk about question eight? Question eight, uh, this is Abhishek. Uh, question eight from uh, chapter 15. Chapter eight from, uh, let's see. We can we can start it. Was this on my was this on my recommended list? Does yeah. anyone remember? It yeah. was okay. The, okay, then 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 we then we can do it for sure. Uh, one of the it looks like it might be a little a little mathy. This one this one might go above and beyond the course, but uh, let, let's at least uh, let's set it up. Uh, number eight. So. Um, they simultaneously and independently select A or B, and if they both uh, select A, the game is over. So player one chooses A or B. So again, here's again where like, uh, if I ask you to put this game into the extensive form, uh, you know, th this is a chapter you know, two question, but it's also a chapter 15 question. Uh, a or B. It's a simultaneous move game, so we have to have a dashed line there, and then player two also picks A and B. And uh, if they both pick uh, A, it's over. If they both pick B, it's over, but with worse payoffs. Then the game continues otherwise, and they have to select positive numbers. And then the payoffs here are x1 plus x2 divided by 1 plus x1 plus x2. Okay. And that's for both. All right. Uh, and that's a, and that's the second stage also. Uh, so that, uh, so in a sub game, oh, compute, well, let's start, start with C first. Uh, in a subgame perfect Nash equilibria, um, those choices are going to um, have to uh, match each other, right? So, so uh, the, the, I'm sorry, in a subgame perfect Nash equilibrium, that second stage, conditional on one playing A and one playing B, that second stage is going to have to be played in an equilibrium. Uh, so, so that um, that x, you know, these these choices of x1 and x2 are going to have to be um, equilibrium choices, OK? Now, let's see. Um, the, the top, the bottom is always going to be one bigger than the top. And so these, the top and the bottom are always going to be between Let's see, if they're both zero, uh, it's zero. And as those numbers get large, it goes to one. Uh, and in a, if one player, let's see, what is the best response to uh, a given choice for a given player? What are, uh, Unfortunately, I think this is, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think if they're, I, I'm trying to reason my way through this question uh, to, to see if I can do it without calculus, because uh, if I use calculus, I'm going to have to use the quotient or the chain rule, and I definitely don't want to require that of the class. So I'm just trying to, I'm, I'm trying to think if there's a, 
if there's a way to reason. Um, so if, if I if I take x2 as given, so I take x2 as given, what is my payoff? Is it so if it if I pick if I pick zero, then I'm gonna get um, x2 over one plus x2. And if I, so I should pick the biggest number possible. Hmm. So I think, let's see. Make sure I got the payoffs right. <sighs> Let's see. Yeah, that one's got me puzzling a little bit. So the way I my intuition right now is telling me that we want to pick the biggest number possible because then, and then what is it? each player gets those gets the same gets the same payoff. Hmm. Yeah, I think both players, it seems like that. So the, the best, the best anyone is going to do is one and that's in the limit as these numbers get arbitrarily large. Uh, I don't see how you can get a payoff uh, bigger than one here. You can't because whatever you pick, you automatically, um, even if the other guy does zero, you're picking. Uh, yeah, so I'm not. Even if we took the derivative in this case, I, I don't, I don't think. Well, let's 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 try it. I, I don't even, I don't think this is a calculus problem, but let's try it. So we can have uh, the utility to player one uh, is equal to. Uh, let's rewrite that just so you're probably more familiar with the product rule than quotient rule. And so. Um, I take x2 as given uh, as player one. Uh, so let's see, uh, I have uh, one, oops, I should tell you what I'm doing here. Uh, we have one and then one plus x1 plus x2 to the minus one plus, uh, and then it should just be x1 plus x2 uh, times minus 1, 1 plus x1 plus x2 to the minus 2. And then the inside is just uh, x1, not just 1, so that's fine. Okay. So I'm going to have 1 over 1 plus x1 plus x2 plus, uh, I'll make that a minus, minus x1 plus x2 over 1 plus x1 plus x2 squared. Okay. Uh, and then this side, and now we're going to make it uh, 1 plus x1 plus x2 minus x1 minus x2 over 1 plus x1 plus x2 squared, which is just equal to 1 over uh, 1 plus x1 plus x2 squared. Okay, um, so that's the best response. Well, that no, that's the derivative. Um, the only way that that um, is the is is the that that represents the best response by setting it equal to zero is if the second derivative is negative. 
Uh, the second derivative of this. Uh, so we're going to get uh, minus two times the thing on the inside to the minus three uh, times one. So yeah, that's going to be that is that's going to be negative because x has to be greater than zero. So it's going to be one over some positive number, and uh, that's a second. So okay, so so that we can set the derivative equal to zero. Uh, so one over one plus x one plus x two. We want that to equal zero. All right. Uh, let's see. I can take. Yeah, that's the problem. I can't set it equal to zero. There's no way to make this. So yeah, that, that so that it's basically the the closest I can get is when both players make the numbers as as um as big as they as big as they possibly can. Yeah. So both. So the solution to the to the to the sub game is that both players um, choose x and uh, x one and x two um, to go to infinity. They want to make those numbers um, as big as they possibly can. Uh, so uh, x one x two approach infinity. Um, the key is is that in that case the payoff for both players uh, is just going to be one because the limit of those payoffs is, is, is one in the limit as X one and X two go to infinity. Okay. And so in um, the sub game, perfect Nash equilibrium. So now I can, so I can write this as, oops, A, B, A, B, A, B, and then this payoff was five, five, minus one, minus one. And now we know that in the sub game, uh, in, in the equilibrium of the sub game, X approaches infinity for both players. So payoff approaches one. Uh, so we have uh, essentially this. Okay. Uh, and so uh, now you can put that game into the matrix form. A, B, A, B, uh, five, five, minus one, minus one, and one, one. And uh, if uh, player one chooses A, player two picks A, uh, B, uh, so it's a dominant, uh, oops, sorry. Uh, if player one chooses B, uh, player one also chooses, yeah. So, so a dominant strategy. So yeah, the unique S, P, and E is for um, player one to play a um, x is as big as you can picture, and for player two to do the same. Oh, sorry, pick a. Okay. Um, so complicated game, uh, especially, uh, since there's no solution, uh, basically the, there's, there's, there's no solution that calculus allows us to, to, to get to by itself. So we kind of have to reason our way through it. The calculus can show us the direction, uh, that the, that the reason should go. And, uh, it should be clear, uh, that in these payoffs here, uh, because it was X one plus x2 over uh, 1 plus x1 plus x2 no matter no given the choice of the other player no matter what choice you make you're never going to get a payoff bigger than one right 
Uh, so if both players pick zero, your payoff is zero. And then this whole, this payoff here is increasing in the choice of both players, uh, but it's never going to get bigger than one. So one is the upper bound of payoffs and one is approached in the limit as X1 and X2 both go to infinity. And so if that um, sub game, that, that second stage is played in equilibrium where both players are choosing uh, numbers uh, that are arbitrarily large, then those payoffs are quickly approaching uh, one apiece. And so they're both going to choose A uh, off the bat. Uh, so it's recognition of, of what the limits of payoffs could be uh, in, in, that, in that second uh, sub game. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. So, yeah, definitely uh, that one's above and beyond uh, what we would have to do in a class. Like something, you know, it, it could – you could get a question on, on a final that looked like, you know, kind of the same sort of thing. Like here's an A, here's a B. Uh, if, if, if they pick A, there's some payoffs uh, that we know. If they both pick B, there's some payoffs that we know. Uh, if they pick here – you go into a second stage game where you pick X and uh, X1 and X2, uh, and then that game has to be played uh, in equilibrium. But I would make this game right here, the continuous game where you're picking X1 and X2, I would make that um, something that would be calculus solvable. So something, you know, you could have like uh, some kind of effort game, uh, you know, so, so, you know, but some, some kind of game uh, that, that could be solved uh you know with uh with a unique solution and then you know you plug one best response function into the other best response function you figure out what your payoffs are here and then you pick other uh and then you decide what to do earlier in the game based on that choice uh so the structure of this game is definitely uh, you know is a, is a structure that i could put on the on the final but this particular game uh this this idea of, of, of kind of looking like thinking about limits uh, of what those payoffs must be. And, and there's actually not a, a choice of X1 and, and choice of X2. Uh, whatever you pick, um, you should have picked something bigger. <laughs> so basically you have to pick infinity, but there is no number infinity. You can only approach, pick numbers that approach, uh, you know, the limit uh, of, of a sequence of numbers that approach infinity. So that's just, that's a little bit too, that's a much too uh, tedious uh, for, 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 for this class. It's, but the structure of this kind of solution, I hope, uh, may, may make some sense that uh, if there's a second stage that gets resolved to determine those payoffs in a subgame perfect Nash equilibrium, figure out what those payoffs are first, plug them in here, and now solve the whole game knowing what you know about how those numbers have to resolve in the subgame. So that that idea is nice about this question, but the particular question is 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 trickier than than what I would put on the final. All right. Qu questions about that? I know the um, I, I went fast on the previous page when I was working on the derivations because I kind of thought the derivations weren't going to get us anywhere anyway. I just wanted to convince myself of it. I hadn't solved this question before, obviously. Uh, but uh, uh, questions about that? All right. Uh, other questions? From this chapter, other chapters. At this point, we've solved a lot of these questions already from chapter 15, just about all of them. Any, anyone else uh, have any questions? Did you work through any homework uh, or end of chapter questions that got you stumped trying to figure out what the solutions are? Can you go over um, question 14 on the meter? Uh, question what? 14. Question 14. I don't even see a question 14. Which chapter? Um, the midterm. Oh, question 14 on the midterm. Sorry. Uh, well, I didn't see it.
All right, so. So we have a uh, four by two game. Uh, 12, zero. Okay. Um, so the first thing to do, I think where a lot of people went wrong on this question on the midterm was that they start, they, they didn't do iterated dominance first, or in this case, iterated dominance doesn't help, but dominance does uh, to get rid of um, strategies. So if you, the, the, the biggest mistake that people make on, um, on finding uh mixed strategy equilibria is they start assigning probabilities to the all of the strategies before they try to get rid of dominated strategies and iterate the dominated strategies. So uh, that's definitely something to keep in mind um, that if you're looking for equilibria and you know they can be pure strategy or mixed strategy and you haven't gotten things to a two by two yet, try the best you can to take it down as small as you can uh, before finding the mixed strategy equilibria or you're going to create for yourself 10 times more work than is necessary on uh, the question is going to be a lot harder and the question's hard enough even if you do that all right so uh if player one chooses x i'm sorry if player two chooses x a is the best response for player one uh and if um player two plays y uh d is the best response for player one so we're definitely not going to be able to dominate a or d so that's the first thing to recognize is that A and D are not dominated and X and Y are not dominated either. Uh, X is the, or sorry, Y is the best response to A and B, uh, but D is the best response, X is the best response to D. All right, so X, Y, A and D are all safe from dominance. And then we look to see, uh, can B uh, or C uh, be dominated, okay? uh and you know take take your pick uh as to which one we're gonna uh try to dominate um so i see right off the bat that i can dominate b with a combination of a and c so b dominated by um sigma one equal one half zero one half zero uh or sorry uh, one half this should be a, a slightly more weight on the a than the than the c is it because um 12 is bigger than uh, 11 and 4 is greater than one correct so okay. it would well, yeah because so basically if i have a and c if i put a 50 50 mixture on a and c that'll give me exactly 11 which is a tie uh mm. for column x and it'll give me uh, two for column Y. So right. in column Y, I win, but in column X, it's a tie, which isn't good enough. So now I put, if I put just a tiny, tiny bit more weight on the, on the A and a tiny bit less weight on the C, that number is going to get bigger than 11 by a little bit. And the other than the two will shrink, but it won't shrink by enough as long as the epsilon is, is small enough. Okay. I mean, of course, we could also, you could do, what you could do is you, you could, uh, you know, solve it algebraically. And what you'll find is that, um, like, you, you put a probability P on A, put a probability 1 minus P on C, and find out what is the value of P that um, makes the combination better than B in both columns. And what you'll find is P greater than 1 half. So it's, you, you, would, you, would get the, you would get there the exact same way. Um, okay. But so B is definitely dominated. Uh, C is not going to be dominated. Uh, so we can just uh, verify that here. If we try to dominate it with a combination of A and B, uh, we would need that uh, 12P 
plus nine minus nine P has to be greater than 10. That's the first uh, condition, uh, which gives us uh, three P has to be greater than one P greater than a third. And the other con and the other column gives us uh, zero P plus six minus six P greater than four, uh, which means that six P has to be less than two. Uh, so P less than, uh, than one third. So, it, but it's not possible to have P um, be both greater than uh, one third and less than one third. So uh, C not dominated. Okay, but getting rid of B was a, was a very important step. All right, now, uh, so I'm gonna look for mixed strategies for player one and player two. I can let uh, the probability that I'm gonna mix with for player one be R, S, and one minus R minus S. You can use whatever numbers you like. Um, in fact, maybe I'll change those to, to, to a different color. Uh, just oops. Okay, so we have three different strategies, uh, three probabilities, and I'll make this a Q and a one minus Q on player two. Um, and so uh, first question I ask myself, uh, this isn't critical who you start with, this is just how I'm gonna do it, uh, is what will keep player one indifferent between A and C? Uh, so uh, to keep player one indifferent between A and C, uh, we need that uh, 12 times Q uh, plus zero times one minus Q uh, is equal to uh, 10 times Q plus four times one minus Q. Okay, so if player one is going to mix between A and C, he has to be indifferent between A and C, so this must be true. So this puts a restriction on Q. So we need 12Q is equal to uh, four plus six Q. Uh, so four is equal to six Q or Q equals two thirds, okay? So we know the Q has to equal two thirds in order for player one to be indifferent between A and C. But that doesn't mean that player one will mix between A and C because it's possible that D gives a better payoff than both when Q equals uh, two thirds. And if that was true, then Q equals two thirds could, then, then Q equals two thirds would not be part of a mixed strategy equilibrium and player one would not be able to play A and C together as part of an equilibrium, okay? So now we have, we have to see if the utility that returns from A and C is bigger or smaller than D, okay? Uh, so the utility of player one of playing A, given that Q equals two thirds, is equal to 12 times two thirds, plus zero times one third, uh, which equals uh, eight. And we know the utility of C must equal eight. That's how we solve for Q in the first place. And the utility for player one of playing D when Q equals two thirds is equal to nine times two thirds plus six times one third, which is also equal to eight, okay? So player one is indifferent between A, C, and D when Q equals two thirds. And furthermore, if Q is gonna be greater than two thirds, that means player one is gonna like A the most, right? Because it's a 12 and a zero. And so that one's gonna ramp up the fastest when Q increases above two thirds. So his best response is A when Q is greater than two thirds. And uh, the best response is gonna be D when Q is less than two thirds. And so only two thirds will have player one willing to mix anything, okay? So Q equals two third is required for player one to mix at all. For any other Q, player one has a pure strategy best response. And when Q is equal to exactly two thirds, 
player one is indifferent between all three of her strategies. And so now we have to consider mixtures potentially of all three of those strategies to keep player two indifferent from uh, changing uh, for, between X and Y. Okay. So we know that if, so first of all, there's no pure strategy equilibrium in this game. And if there's no pure strategy equilibrium, we know there has to be a mixed strategy equilibrium. So we know that in any equilibrium, Q has to equal two thirds. All right. So we've solved for half of our equilibrium. We know that Q is going to equal two thirds. All right, so now we have to find uh, what's going to keep uh, player uh, two indifferent. So I'll at least start it on this page. Uh, let's try to carve out a little spot for it. Uh, okay, so uh, to keep player two indifferent, uh, we're going to need that um, zero times R plus two times S plus three times one minus R minus S has to equal six times R plus two times S plus zero times one minus R minus S. All right, uh, so we're gonna have that uh, three uh, minus three R minus S is equal to six R plus two S, um, which means that uh, three is equal to nine R plus three S, which means that um, uh, we could say S equals uh, we can divide everything by three and then throw the R on the other side. Uh, S equals one minus three R. Okay. So we have uh, a solution that uh, Sigma one has to equal R zero because B is never played one minus three R. That's the, that's what we found S to equal. And now this last one is one minus R minus S, but we know S is uh, one minus three R. So that's gonna be minus one plus three R. And so in that last part, we can simplify. Uh, one minus one is zero, uh, negative R plus three R is two R. Okay, so that's the, the mixed strategy for player one. For player two, we already know sigma two is equal to two thirds, one third. And the last thing we should do is to put um, restrictions on R. Like it, it, this can't be true for any R. We have to make sure that, that, that a, no probability ever goes below zero and ever goes above one. So uh, R is never allowed to be um, greater than one third. So R less than or equal to one third. The reason is, is that um, if R goes bigger than one third, one minus three times R would be a negative number and that's not allowed. So that's one restriction. The second restriction is that um, R has to be less than one half or less than or equal to one half. Okay, all right, bye Ariel. So R uh, has to be less than or equal to one half. Otherwise that last probability could be greater than one and that's not allowed, okay? Uh, but of those restrictions, one is subsumed by the other. So uh, R less than or equal to one third is the, is, is the relevant restriction because if that's met, then the second restriction is met as well. So that's our, our, our uh, mixed strategy equilibria is that one for player two and this one for player one with the restriction that R has to be less than or equal to one third. Uh, qu questions about that? Got it, thank you.
All right. I still have a, uh, it's 1030, but I, if, if anyone has another question or two, if they've been waiting to ask, I, I can still, uh, I can, I can still answer a question or two. Does anyone have one? Going once, going twice. We all good? If I have a question, can I still email you? Yeah, sure. Okay. The closer the email gets to the exam day, the less, you know what I mean? The less likely right. it is I'll be able to, like, sometimes I'll get emails at like three o'clock in the morning on uh, Tuesday night. <laughs> like that's yeah. The chances of me being awake at three o'clock in the morning on Tuesday night and being sober enough to answer your question is very small. So that's okay. not going to happen. All right, cool. All right, guys. Well, I will see you on uh, Wednesday then. And, uh, you know, happy, happy studying. Stay safe. Thank you. Bye, guys.